tuning in. I'm going to talk about future proofing for energy and water savings today. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear someone else. Um, so I, um, I'm the principal of Essential Habitat Architecture. I've been working in Passive House since 2008, mostly in California and mostly in the Bay Area. I've worked on maybe 30 projects. And uh, I realized that they don't exist in a bubble. Um, so that's kind of a long-winded way of me telling you that today I'm going to talk about a building that isn't even a passive house. But the principles I'm going to discuss, I think, are very uh, applicable. And the reasoning, sort of the thinking that I'm going to use on this is the same sort of thinking that I use to think through passive house energy issues. So this is a picture from the 1940s of our Tuscan ruin. In addition to an architect, I am an amateur developer. And my wife and I purchased this building um, several years ago and set about to repair it. And people said, oh, hey, Graham, are you going to make a passive house? And I said, eventually, but right now I just need to aim for house. Um, so this thing was kind of falling over and we kept the scope within our means and patched things up. But while we were doing it, we did, did some things that I think are really critical. And I think they're critical enough that I make them standard in all my plan sets. I don't even ask the client whether they want this stuff. It's just, it's included and I'll explain why. So uh, this is a pie chart of the the site energy use of an average California household. And when I developed this maybe 10 years, 12 years ago, I was shocked. And I wasn't shocked, I wasn't shocked by how low the heating energy is. So this is just, this is a, an average of all the households that exist across California. Um, Cause we've done, we do way better than this. You know, when we do our passive houses, we, we cut that way, way down, though we do have stiff competition and baseline in terms of making sure that things perform well. What really shocked me was that hot water was larger than heating. And this is just across the state. And so what that said to me was, if, if the hot water is not attended to, you're, you're really leaving something behind. And furthermore, Fixing the building shell is great, but someone, if someone dealt with the hot water really well and didn't even bother with the, the trouble of passive house, you might actually get to a lower energy use. So the trick is, I'm not, I'm not suggesting not to do passive house. Of course you do passive house, but you have, to, you have to do that hot water as well. And yes, this is looking at California with a mild climate, but I might argue that a lot of multifamily buildings elsewhere probably have this kind of, especially larger buildings have this kind of thing where the, the heating demand may not be the largest thing. And beyond that, most passive houses look kind of like this where the hot water is the single biggest end use. So you can dial into this a little bit further and look at a pie chart that shows what uses of hot water there are and which ones are the greatest. And we see that showers are the largest typical in a house. And there's a really great passive solution for that. But before we get to that, again, with passive house, you want to start with efficiency first. So you want to use water efficient fixtures, cluster the fixtures together to shorten the pipes, insulate the hot water pipes, make sure all your pipes are in conditioned space. I know in, in places where pipes freeze, you guys are avoid that, but here in California, it's, it's often easier said than done, getting the pipes in conditioned space, but very important. And you want efficient water heating. So this is a, a device that many of you may be familiar with. Um, it's a drain water heat recovery device. And it's, it's similar to a, a heat exchanger in a ventilation system in that it extracts the heat from waste, in this case, waste water leaving the building. And so there's basically a coil around the sewer pipe or the wastewater pipe. And as warm water is leaving, cold water is, is wrapped around the outside and it takes the, it basically takes the heat from that wastewater and 
transfers it to this water and warms that water. So you're, you're again, like in Passive House, recycling the heat inside. This diagram on the right, uh, I, I really like the drawing, but it's kind of ridiculous because it does not work for tubs. It, this has to be happening simultaneously. So basically, you have to be using the hot water at the same time that you're sending hot water down the drain. Um, and it works best if you plumb the, the, the warmed water or the tempered water both to the hot water tank on the cold side and to the shower valve. And so basically what happens is as you begin taking your shower, ideally this, this shower valve should be a thermostatic valve so it does this automatically, but the, what's, what's called the cold water begins to warm up the valve will automatically reduce the amount of hot water that it's drawing as the, as the, th the thing comes into equilibrium. You also want to send it in the cold water of the hot water tank because you don't want to be pulling cold water straight in. So this, this can save about 18% of shower energy and incidentally, or interestingly, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of the studies on this are from Canada and they talk about adding a 0.12 energy factor to the heating system, water heating system in some modeling software um, as an approximation of what this does. So it's a great addition. California also has a history of, of drought and uh, Sean found this photo and I used it again. Um, this, you know, you, you think about skateboarding now, basically developed because we had droughts in the past and people couldn't keep their pools full. So there are all these empty pools that people could skateboard in, Dogtown, Sea Boys and all the rest. But this is part of our uh, existence, and so it's always in the back of my mind. Uh, beyond that, though, water is equivalent to energy. The water that you get in your house doesn't just show up by magic. Uh, this, again, varies by location and circumstance. But in California, simply delivering water to buildings is 2% of the total energy that the state consumes. So it's significant. And so you want to be mindful, not only about saving hot water energy, but saving water as well for energy uses as well, or energy aspects, as well as just environmental aspects. So we can look at a pie chart of residential water use in California. And again, this varies. This is not every building, but this is kind of an average. And we see there's an enormous amount of water used outdoor, uh, inside, Toilets and clothes washing together add up to a pretty significant chunk of the interior. So we'll look at some solutions to save water. Again, conservation first, water efficient fixtures, cluster the fixtures together, efficient and native landscaping. So in my area, a lawn requires about three feet of irrigation water per year over the entire thing to keep it alive. And, and a dirty secret is that there's very little grass in the US that has not been, that was not originally brought over from England, even Kentucky bluegrass. And most of the climates in the US are very different from England. If it's not raining in England right now, it probably will be by the time this talk is over. So um, lawns are really a problem and very water thirsty. So it's really worth considering finding alternatives and also permeable hand, um, hardscapes which will allow rainwater to just go right into the ground and recharge the aquifer. Using rainwater in our climate, we're in a Mediterranean climate, so uh, it's a problem for irrigation because we have dry summers and wet winters and that's the opposite of, the, basically the water comes at the time we don't need it for irrigation or you could, by conversely you could say we need to irrigate because it doesn't rain in the summer. So rainwater, direct rainwater to landscape isn't, isn't really the killer app for us. Gray water is. And gray water is basically using all of the wastewater in your house except for uh, kitchen sink and toilets. That water can be used for subsurface irrigation. And in fact, where I live, the water district now, if you do a major remodel of a house or build a new house, you, you are required to install a, drain, a gray water system. Some of them are quite simple, but in any case, 
this is the, our solution for uh, irrigation. And it also takes some of the burden off of the sewer system as well, which is also a benefit. Uh, rainwater is useful, especially useful if you can use it indoors because you can, you can apply that water that's rushing by the house or going into storm drains and so forth to, to flush toilets and do cold water laundry. And you can also have a tank and store it to use in the summertime, but you get a much higher yield out of the system if you can use it during the time that the rain is falling, during the seasons the rain is falling. So interior use is really a good solution. Uh, here's an example of a project of ours from Santa Cruz. They put in a rainwater system and they, they, their calculations are they save 6,000 to 8,500 gallons a year from, with interior. Uh, lastly, structured plumbing. So this is basically a way of saving the water. You know how in a, in a lot of people's houses, you, you go to take a shower and you turn on the shower and the water's cold. And so you stand back from the shower and you let that water run down the drain until it's warm enough to get in without uh, shocking you. Well, that adds up to quite a lot of water waste. And so this, this is basically a system that has a hot water return line. So it will take all the water out of those pipes, send it back to the water heater and fill the pipes with hot water before you turn the shower on. So rather than dumping all that perfectly good lukewarm water down the drain, it just goes back to the water heater. And the goal with these systems is to use less than one cup of water waiting for hot water at the fixtures. And calculations on this can save 3,600 to 12,000 gallons a year in a house and about 800 to 1,600 kilowatt hours per year of energy because the, the water that you're flushing down the drain is not cold water. That at coldest, that would be room temperature water. So keeping that in your water heating system rather than introducing cold water out of the ground also saves energy. And this improves comfort and convenience for, for homeowners. So uh, this is a system diagram of our house and it's actually two units. The top floor there, this is, I, I, again, I just stripped the plumbing fixtures out of the, the BIM model, but the top floor is a separate apartment and then there's a two-story apartment beneath. And this is, I'm just gonna quickly illustrate the approach that I took. So the first thing is black water, take plumbing the black water to sewer. In the top apartment, the gray water as well is going to the sewer because I, there, that, that unit was actually occupied and that sewer line goes in a different direction. And so that, that part did not get desegregated. But uh, in any case, this is step one is plumb, you know, drains as usual. Step two, collect the gray water. So I've got everything but kitchen sink and toilets and dishwashers, basically kitchen sink. Those are black water. Every other source of wastewater in the, in the building is gray water and it's all collected together and brought down through the house to a single pipe where it can be directed either to irrigate landscape or go to the sewer, such as in the wintertime when it's raining and you don't want to be there's no need for irrigation and putting gray water in wet ground could, could have pollution issues. Third is the drain water heat recovery. And again, it's convenient if you're already collecting the gray water to just run the gray water through the drain water heat recovery device, which is this, this diagonal blue line. And I've got the blue line, water going around the gray water pipe and supplying the cold side of the shower in the master bedroom bathroom and going to the cold side of the water heater. And lastly, plumbing the supplies to all the toilets and the cold side of the laundry with rainwater ready plumbing. And it's basically purple, purple PEX tubing. And I just do a home run system through the building and have it all ready. And so now this, bit, this setup, this building is rainwater and gray water ready. And then final thing is the structured plumbing. And this is basically a hot water loop that runs around the building, gets very close to all the hot water using fixtures. And there's a pump, there's a pump here that pumps that 
on, there are buttons in each bathroom that you press when you're about ready to take a shower. The pump runs, pulls all the lukewarm water back into the hot water heater, fills the supply loop with hot water and you turn on the shower and you don't have to flush a bunch of water down the drain. Here are some pictures inside the building. So this is on the left here, this is the kitchen wall. That's the drain water heat recovery device. And to the right of it, you can see some of the purple PEX tubes going upstairs into the, sorry, this, I just seem to click without me doing anything, uh, going upstairs into the bathroom and laundry. And on the right is what it looks like all covered up, almost done with this project. Uh, upstairs, this is, you can see a PEX tube supplying the water to the toilet and a couple more running upstairs into the bathrooms above. One thing to note, if you're in, intending to have a bidet seat, you should really have that with potable water uh, by health code. You're not supposed to have human contact with rainwater unless it's been treated. So there's a separate little line here to supply cold, essentially cold drinking water to run the bidet seat. Over here, bathroom almost finished. On the right, you can see the little button here. This is the button that will trigger the uh, on-demand hot water recirculation and the shower is behind us. Here's the laundry. Again, you can see the PEX tube running to the cold side. And on the right, the same finished out area. Here, there's a, a basically a signal wire for the future so that you can turn the, uh, the gray water on and off without having to go all the way down into the basement. And you, you do that seasonally Obviously, when it, during rainy season, you turn off the irrigation, but you might also, for instance, if someone were using bleach in their laundry, and we can debate whether you, could, you can debate that with someone else. I'm, I've given up debating that, but uh, if you're using bleach, you, want to, you don't want that going into your garden, so you could flip that off for the duration of that wash. And downstairs in the Lower bathroom, again, you can see pecs for the toilet. You can see a separate line here for bidet seat. And again, the trigger for the, the uh, on-demand hot water. And this is basically what it looks like. Low flush toilet, dual flush, uh, on-demand hot water recirculation and gray water, I'm sorry, rainwater plumbing to the toilets. Underneath the building, you can see this is where the, the, the two pipes come together. This line is black water from the toilet and the kitchen sink coming in here. This is all the gray water in the house and I purposely left this long piece of pipe here so that when we implement a gray water system, we can just take that pipe out and install a diversion valve like this one. This is a a pool valve that's often used for gray water systems and it's got an electric actuator and up right up here this is the wire the trigger wire from up in the laundry that could be used to trigger that. Uh, collecting rainwater so on the side here you see this pipe coming down I basically collected all of the roof water that was previously undermining all the foundations and whatnot got it all into one pipe comes down here, goes underground, and right now spills down under this deck. But this deck would be a great place to have a water storage tank. So that's the idea in the future is got all the rainwater being collected and it can be stored right there. And then as I told you earlier, we've got this PEX, this PEX home run system supplying, at this point it's connected to city water but I've got one to each of the toilets and one to each of the laundry. In the future, that can be disconnected and set up to use a, a rainwater supply. And that is the end of the story. Um, you know, I've told you it was a Tuscan ruin. In a, when we're feeling more optimistic, we also call it Villa Fortunata. But in any case, thank you for your time. <laughs>